Dobry, witam wszystkich serdecznie. Jak co czwartek zapraszam do naszej kawiarenki płodności Vitrolaj. Szanowni Państwo, dzisiaj jest wyjątkowy dzień, ponieważ profesor Rafał Kurzawa zaprosił również wyjątkowego gościa. Dziękujemy za liczne pytania do naszych ekspertów. Te pytania, na które nie znajdziecie Państwo tutaj odpowiedzi, oczywiście będą w następnej kawiarence pozostawione na naszym nagraniu. Szanowni Państwo, żeby nie przedłużać, bo dzisiaj jest bardzo wyjątkowych dwóch gości, od razu zapraszam swoich gości na wizję. I już 3, 2, 1. Dzień dobry Panom. Halo, dzień dobry. Szanowni Państwo, przedstawiam profesor Rafał Kurzawa, Specjalista ginekolog, położnik, specjalista endokrynologii ginekologicznej i rozroczości, specjalista embiologii klinicznej, kierownik katedry Zakładu Ginekologii i Zdrowia Porokreacyjnego PUM w Szczecinie, wiceprezes Polskiego Towarzystwa Medycyny Rozrodu i Embiologii, współzałożyciel Centrum Ginekologii i Leczenia Niepłodności Vitrolaj w Szczecinie, dyrektor medyczny The Fertility Partnership w Polsce, profesor Tim Chait, dyrektor medyczny The Fertility Partnership Współtwórca Fertility Partnership, ginekolog i specjalista w dziedzinie medycyny reprodukcyjnej oraz chirurgii, profesor w obszarze medycyny reprodukcyjnej z Uniwersytetu od Oxford. Szanowni Państwo, to są nasi szanowni dzisiaj goście, którzy będą odpowiadać na 10 pytań, które, które przysłaliście Państwo do naszej kawiarenki płodności Vitrolite. I ja już może nie będę przedłużać, oprócz tego, że chciałabym jeszcze nawiązać do logotypu The Fertility Partnership. Wymiana doświadczeń, dzielenie się najlepszymi praktykami, dostęp do najnowszych badań i innowacji, ścisłe monitorowanie bezpieczeństwa i skuteczności leczenia to siła międzynarodowej sieci klinik The Fertility Partnership, w której oczywiście znajduje się Vitrolife Polska w Szczecinie. Szanowni panowie, oddaję głos naszemu gospodarzowi dzisiejszego wydarzenia, tak jest troszeczkę dzisiaj inaczej. Panie profesorze, panie profesorze Rafał Kurzawa, oddaję głos, a ja może, może uciekam na razie. Do usłyszenia, do zobaczenia. Okay. Tim, for your information, that was a very kind introduction of, of yourself and myself. So I know you don't speak Polish, so don't worry, nothing wrong was actually said. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, what I can tell you that I'm really very happy to, to have you here with us and then you will have, we will have the ability to use your expertise in, in answering some questions which patients, Polish patients, uh, keep on asking us every week. So we've already answered more than 300 questions. Uh, As you know, I've been to Poland a number of times to visit um, both you and also our colleagues down in Krakow, and I, I love the country and the people, and, um, and I know that there's very close bonds between the UK and Poland generally. I see many Polish people have been working in the UK and are still in the UK, and uh, so I'm delighted that, um, that, that the Fertility Partnership has such a close relationship with, with Poland, and I'm very happy to be involved in uh, this discussion today, so thank you for asking me. Thank you. So I have to tell you, I have a little stage fright, which is uh, no wonder. I had several lectures in Polish and English and the stage fright now, it's probably because because we have the most important audience today, the, the, the patients. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I decided to pick up 10 questions for the today's meeting of the areas which are the most commonly asked during the meetings that I had so far. And let me start from the first question. May, may you have the first question, please? And if you don't um, see the full uh, transcript, let me read it for you. I am after a miscarriage following IVF. Fallopian tubes are not patent. What to pay attention to before the next step? What additional tests should I perform? Should I take any extra medications after the next transfer? When can I try again? Well, my view on that would be obviously with, with the fallopian tubes um, not being patent, then the only route to pregnancy will be with IVF. And um, it sounds very strange to say it, but because you got pregnant and had a miscarriage, that actually is a very positive thing to take away. Because we know that in the IVF laboratory, the eggs and the sperm can make embryos, the em an embryo has been put back and it's implanted. Sadly, miscarriages can happen whether after a natural uh, conception or after an IVF conception. But the fact that you got pregnant is the real positive to take from this. Um, there aren't any drugs that we can give to reduce the risk of miscarriage. So my view would be to look at the positives of this, to move forward to another IVF cycle, 
And we know implantation can happen. It can happen again. And once it happens, then there's going to be a good chance of live birth. And what is the risk of uh, miscarriage after IVF and, and, and general patients, the population which uh, have IVF? What would you assess it? I mean, like, is it like the same in, in general population, around 20% or is it more often or less? No, I, I, I would say, it's a good question. I would say it's about the same. I mean, in the end, it's the same eggs and sperm that are making the embryo in IVF or natural conception. So, um, and it's the age of the woman, which is the main factor affecting the, the chance of miscarriage. So a 40 year old woman getting pregnant naturally or having IVF will have a very similar miscarriage rate. But, but most pregnancies do not end in miscarriage. Most pregnancies will go on to live birth. Okay, so very positive uh, information for a patient. Uh, that is something that I'm used to say all the time and, and tell the patients that uh, actually uh, uh, single miscarriage is not a bad prognostic factor. Uh, in fact, um, the probability of pregnancy is, is, is high in patients who were once pregnant, at least once pregnant. Okay, let me, let me have another question. Um, I'm after two laparoscopies and diagnosis of endometriosis and an obstructed fallopian tube. Should I start IVF right away? Do I have any chance for pregnancy after insemination? So, I mean, clearly you've had two, you've had two laparoscopies or so two keyhole surgeries. Um, you've got endometriosis. We know that having endometriosis can reduce the chance of natural conception. And we know that one of your fallopian tubes is blocked, which unsurprisingly can also reduce the chance of natural conception. So insemination treatment uh, can work because one of your tubes is open, so it's possible insemination treatment will work. But IVF, uh, going back to the 1970s, was designed to treat women with damaged tubes. So if we're comparing the success rates of insemination treatment or IVF, IVF is going to be higher, particularly in someone with endometriosis and with a, um, a blocked fallopian tube. So I think in summary, I'd say that, yes, insemination could work if you wanted to try it. But realistically, the most successful treatment for you is going to be moving on to, um, to IVF. Thank you, Tim. So let's move to our third question. It's, it's a little bit longer. I am a PCOS patient. Seven years trying to get pregnant. I've had three inseminations, finally IVF. It was stimulation with small doses. Five cells were retrieved, five fertilized, two transfers failed. Semen parameters, great results. Doctors are also referring to it as idiopathic infertility. I was never pregnant. We have been together for 12 years. Is it a good idea to transfer two embryos during the next attempt? Uh, I was also offered a COFIL, which is GM CSF. Does it make sense? I am 37 years old. What should I do now? One comment. This is very common situation that uh, to uh, apparently was the intention to increase pregnancy chances. Um, some patients are offered double ambient transfers instead of single ambient transfers and immunological interventions like here, it was GM CSF. What, what do you, what do you, I, I know this is a very controversial area, but we need a slight clarification upon this. I, mean, I think you, that you, you've, you've um, you know, the person writing this question has been through so much. You've got you know, seven years, I've got the question here in front of me as well, seven years of trying to get pregnant, which is obviously a very, very long time. You've had a number of treatments um, and I can see why you're getting desperate and you're really wanting to look for answers, look, look to see what else can be can be added in. Um, I mean, I think the in terms of insemination treatment, you've tried insemination treatment, it hasn't worked, so I can see why you went on to have um, IVF. And we know that uh, five, egg, five eggs or five cells were collected, all five fertilized, so a good fertilization rate, <clears throat> but you've had two embryo transfers that have, um, that have failed. Now, in terms of what can be done differently, um, I, mean, I think the approach in the UK probably would be you've had two failed IVF cycles and you're 37 now. So I, I think putting two embryos back would be a reasonable thing to do. Um, if it was your first ever cycle, then I would be suggesting one embryo back. But I think having a double embryo transfer, certainly from a UK perspective, would be entirely reasonable just as a way of trying to increase the success rate for that embryo transfer procedure. 
And obviously, if there are spare embryos or eggs left over to freeze, and then they can be frozen um, as well. Now, in terms of the um, the, the GM, the CSF, the Acafil, um, that is something which uh, my feeling is there is no proof or no evidence of any benefit of trying things such as this. And we know that within, within IVF, um, partly through the understandable desperation of, of couples, but also because doctors just want to feel as though they're giving something, they're very often things are just tried. The problem is that if you just try things, potentially it could do good, also potentially it could do harm. So a, a, a concern I have of just trying things where there's no evidence of benefit is there could also be some downside of that as well. And I think with, with CSF, it has been studied. The studies aren't great. They're relatively small studies, so quite low power, which means they're not very good quality studies. But so far, I would say there is no suggestion of any benefit of using um, CSF. So certainly the UK approach would be not to be um, adding in something like CSF. So I, just, I think just in summary, um, You've been through a number of insemination, three insemination cycles, two IVF cycles. It hasn't worked yet. You've still got age on your side. I'd be very encouraging to move on to, to further IVF with perhaps the team looking in more detail at the, the type of stimulation protocol that you had to see if anything can be tweaked or changed with the stimulation. And then I think putting two embryos back, as, as you suggested in the question, would be an, a reasonable thing to do next. And... Are two failed transfers for you repeated IVF failures? So the approach that we've it depends on the um, so the approach that we've taken is if you have two good quality blastocysts, which are day five embryos going back, then that would be um, repeated uh, failures. So yes, I think what you're questioning as well is whether it's worth going on and doing further investigations for implantation failure, which I think we'll come on to in some of the other questions I saw later on in terms of what investigations could be done for implantation failure. I have to say that nearly always these investigations for implantation failure come back as completely normal. And it's unusual that you find a, a, a proven or even a logical cause as to why embryos haven't implanted beyond chance. And chance is always the main factor here. So when a couple make an embryo, and if you know, the woman's 37, as in this question, then the, the chance of that embryo implanting could be 30 or 40%. So therefore, most embryos don't implant. That's why it often takes a few cycles to have success. So if you have one or two cycles that don't work, it's a bit like flipping a coin and it coming up tails rather than heads. For most people, unfortunately, it's chance or, or bad luck rather than, there, rather than there being an underlying issue. And it's a really good good place to, to talk a little bit longer about repeated IVF failures. So um, another question which comes to my mind, uh, what is the biggest problem in couples with repeated IVF failures when it is really true repeated IVF failure? What are, what are the major reasons for you? So a lot of the, I mean, it's a very, very good question. It's something that I'm sure my, you, yourself as well, Rafael, it'll be something that um, when, when people come in, with repeated IVF cycle failures, particularly three, four, five failures, which, which fortunately is not very, it's not a common thing, but when patients come in, they'll understandably want to know the answers. So we, my feeling would be that the, the main factor of affecting the chance of an embryo implanting is the genetic quality of that embryo. And the main factor affecting the genetic quality of the embryo is the age of the woman. So unfortunately, it's just a very true statement that the older the woman, the lower the chance of success. Now for most women, um, patients in their 20s, 30s, up to mid 30s, the success rates are the same. From the mid 30s um, age for the woman, the success rates do start to drop down. And in particular, if the woman is in her 40s, the success rates are getting quite low. And that's because the genetic quality of her eggs are low, which means the genetic quality of the embryos will be low. And most of those embryos either don't implant or if they do implant, there's an increased risk of miscarriage. So whenever we're looking at, in, whenever we're looking at implantation failure, it's the first question always is what's the age of the woman? Because we can have embryos that look absolutely beautiful on the outside, but if they come from a woman who's 45 years old, they can look fine on the outside, but nearly all of them will be genetically abnormal 
on the inside, which means they have the wrong numbers of, of chromosomes. So in terms of investigations for a current implantation failure, a lot of them have come from the investigations that are done during recurrent miscarriage. And some people feel that recurrent miscarriage being at the sort of one end of the spectrum, that maybe recurrent implantation failure is on the same spectrum, but at the other end. So the sort of tests that, it, that would be done would be to look to see, are there any underlying issues in the woman, which, which, may be, um, which make it more likely that the embryo will not implant. So in particular, looking at the uterus. So does she have problems with fibroids? So particularly fibroids which are in the lining of the uterus, in the endometrial cavity, or large fibroids in the wall of the uterus. So basically anything that's distorting the endometrium, so the lining of the uterus, we know can reduce the chances of, of implanting and perhaps can be treated successfully with surgery. So a detailed ultrasound scan of the, um, ut of the uterus. You may also want to look inside the uterine cavity to confirm that there's no scarring, and that can be done with a hysteroscopy procedure, which is a very straightforward procedure, or even with putting some saline or some water in the uterus um, with a small tube and then doing an ultrasound scan and seeing whether there's any scarring. So the water sort of pushes the front and back wall of the uterus apart. So what I'm getting at is just checking the uterus to make sure it looks okay. That's the first thing. The second test for implantation failure would be some form of blood clotting test. And this is where we do get into the immune side of things a bit. So we know that a, it's not a common cause, but we know that a recognized cause of recurrent miscarriage is um, the woman having um, uh, blood clotting problems or sticky blood and that can be due in particular to two things so one is um, called lupus anticoagulant and the other is anticardiolipin antibodies so you, you see I, I use the word antibodies which means there's an immune aspect to this and we know that if women with recurrent miscarriage have these um, anticardiolipin antibodies or lupus um, anticoagulant if we give those women a, um, a blood thinning drugs such as heparin, we can actually improve the live birth rate by cutting down the miscarriage rate. The thinking is that you can also do those same tests in couples with recurrent implantation failure. So I think a thrombophilia or full blood clotting screen would be an important test to do. Um, the, the two tests I mentioned, lupus anticoagulant and anticardiolipin, are two of them but there are many, many, many other tests that are done as part of a full thrombophilia clotting screen um, as well. Further tests could be to look at the genetics of the man and the woman. So we know that one or 2% of people can be completely normal people, but may have a problem with a, a translocation. A translocation is when bits of chromosomes have swapped around um, in, in, the, in the person's body, and that would have happened at conception or before conception. And if you have a translocation in yourself, you can be a completely normal person, but when you make eggs or sperm, your, your, your genetics in your cells have to split. And if you have a translocation, they may not split evenly, which means uh, if you have a translocation, then when you make eggs or sperm, your eggs or sperm may be more likely to be abnormal, to have the wrong numbers of chromosomes in. And therefore, as I said before, that can lead on to embryos to have the wrong numbers of chromosomes in and therefore a higher miscarriage rate. So one of the common tests that's done for a current miscarriage is a carrier type or a genetic test for the man and the woman. And so that can also be done for people with recurrent implantation failure. So I would say those are the main three areas of testing. It would be checking the woman's uterus, checking her blood clotting, and considering checking the genetics of the man or the woman as well. Now, unfortunately, there's a huge gray area beyond there where you can go off having all sorts of testing. Um, immune testing is, it comes in and out of favor a bit. In the UK at the moment, um, the HFEA, which is the government regulatory authority, which is very, very evidence-based, the, the, the doctors and the scientists in the HFEA have looked at the evidence for and against immune testing and have generally said, don't do it. So in the UK, we really don't do immune testing anymore. Uh, we don't do testing for natural killer cells. We don't do lymphocyte testing. There's no evidence of benefit. And there is evidence that the drugs that are used to treat these problems that you pick up that may not be a problem in the first place anyway, there is evidence that the drugs are used to treat them 
can actually cause some harm. So that's something that we don't do. So I would say, coming back to the original question, checking the uterus, making sure that's all fine, looking at blood clotting, looking at the genetics of, of, the, um, of the couple as well. And obviously just considering general health, I mean, optimizing weight, if the woman is overweight, then getting down BMI, um, stopping smoking. Smoking increases the, increases the miscarriage rate. Smoking in men and women is linked to a raised miscarriage rate. Checking thyroid function, making sure the thyroid function is okay. Um, and just trying to optimize health, healthy diet, Mediterranean diet is often spoken about, just relatively easy things that can be done to, um, to maximize your chances of success. That's a very long answer, Raphael, to a very short yeah, question. It's, it's great, really great coverage of, of the issue, but I'm really happy to hear that you are saying more or less what I'm saying. So thank you. So uh, you actually answered some, partially at least, some of the following questions, so uh, we will probably faster through them. Uh, there is one which is very interesting for me. Could cancer treatment, question number four, could cancer treatment in the past somehow stimulate our immune system and therefore make it overactive? Does cancer treatment affect fertility despite the fact that it has led only to partial decline in the ovarian reserve? It's a very interesting question, that one, actually. So obviously it may depend partly what type of cancer treatment we're, we're talking about. Um, I'm, I'm presuming that this is sort of some um, um, like a chemotherapy type cancer treatment because you yeah. mentioned it led to a partial decline in the ovarian reserve. So ovarian reserve means numbers of eggs um, in the ovaries. Now, I'm not aware of any evidence at all that having cancer treatment, whether chemotherapy or radiotherapy, um, stimulates the immune system leading on leading to infertility problems. I, I'm, I'm not aware of any evidence for that. Are you, are you Rafael, have you heard of anything along this no, line? No, no, no. no. Okay. so I, I would be reassuring to you. So I think the main thing is reassurance to you that um, if you've had your cancer treatment, you're in remission, your oncology doctors are happy with your progress, then the cancer treatment has been successful and that it won't have affected your fertility. You're quite right in the second part of the question that the main issue with cancer treatment can be it um, reducing ovarian reserve. So we will see that tests such as AMH, so a blood test for ovarian reserve, if that's measured before and after, some types of cancer treatment and that can we can see a reduction in ovarian reserve but it really comes back to what we said before the main factor affecting success rate is the age of the woman's eggs so as long as your age is okay and as long as you have some ovarian reserve so that you know we can either get eggs from you during IVF or you're still having regular cycles um, for insemination or your ovaries respond to drug, drugs during insemination that I'd be reassuring that I, I don't think the cancer treatment would have been linked the time when cancer treatment can be a problem is if women have a pelvic cancer and are having radiotherapy. So a, a cervical or uterine uh, um, uh, cancer where radiotherapy is being given to the pelvis can cause problems by causing uh, anatomical changes uh, in the pelvis. Or if there was um, a type of ovarian cancer where you've had surgery and parts of the ovary have been removed, that can cause some issues as well. But I think from your question, I'll be very reassuring. I don't think the cancer treatment has caused a problem and um, I wish you all the very best. Can it affect negatively quality of the gametes, of the oocytes? It doesn't appear to. I mean, again, there, there have been concerns about radiotherapy affecting the quality of the eggs, for instance. But we know that in men, for instance, men who've had chemotherapy, um, that's, that sometimes that can then reduce sperm production, but then once the sperm production comes back, there's no evidence actually that the sperm is any, like, any more likely to be genetically abnormal um, after chemotherapy, because it, if, the, if the testes are damaged by the chemotherapy, they don't produce sperm. If the testes are okay, they'll be producing sperm. Um, and in the, in the ovaries, um, again, it's, it's it, someone who's taking chemotherapy now then yes, some of the chemotherapy um, can damage eggs and embryos. So that's why usually you'd be looking at having treatment before or after chemotherapy. But there's no evidence that having had chemotherapy causes permanent genetic damage to, to the eggs or the embryos. I'd be reassuring about that. Okay, the following questions are more or less on the issues that we already discussed, but I will go through them, maybe some additional comments. Uh, do immunological tests seem justified when implantation does not take place despite several transfers? 
Are there any risks associated with possible immunological treatment? Any, any additional comments? Actually, you answered that earlier. No additional comments. Just, again, I, I absolutely understand why couples think there must be a, a, an immune thing going on because all the tests are coming back as normal. The IVF doctors are saying everything's fine. We've not, we've not found a reason why your treatment hasn't worked. So I can understand why people think, well, there must be an immune thing going on. It's all over the internet. You read it in all of the, the chat rooms. Um, but the honest truth is that um, there's no evidence that testing for any of these immune type things, apart from the blood clotting tests I mentioned, there's no evidence of, of any benefit. And the, the, the risk is you could do harm by taking some of the drugs that are thrown around to treat things that may not be a problem in the first place. Okay. Uh Question number six, how can the embryo be protected against the effects of autoimmune diseases? Endometriosis, uh, second degree AFS positive, ANA2, treated hypothyroidism, Hashimoto disease, AMH, 11 nanogram per milliliter, not pico molds, but, but nanogram, mild insulin resistance, efforts to get pregnant since 2016, until now one by a chemical pregnancy to unsuccessful IUIs. So I think in, I mean, in women who, or women or men who have various autoimmune diseases, and uh, I mean, we wouldn't, in the UK, we wouldn't generally think of endometriosis as an autoimmune disease, but um, Hashimoto's disease and ANA, of course, yes, would be autoimmune disease there. The, the main factor is to, uh, is to work with the physicians who are looking after you from an autoimmune perspective to make sure that you are uh, appropriately treated. So if you have an underlying issue, an underlying thyroid disease, then to make sure that the, your endocrinologist is happy that your um, your underlying medical conditions are appropriately treated and that you are in remission from an autoimmune perspective. If, if the woman has normal thyroid function now because you're taking whatever drugs it is, Either you have an overactive or underactive thyroid, and you're you're on the appropriate treatment for that from your endocrinologist. Then, um, and and for any of the other, we have I've had patients with you know rheumatoid arthritis, um, you know, autoimmune kidney disease, all sorts of things. My main focus is to say to them just to get as well or as, as healthy as possible from an autoimmune perspective, because what can affect IVF is if someone is ill with an autoimmune disease. So if someone has um, renal or kidney autoimmune disease and they are, you know, they're not taking the medication they've been told to take because they think it's bad for IVF. Well, the problem with that is if their renal or kidney autoimmune disease is uncontrolled, that will affect the IVF success rate and also risks during pregnancy. So the main focus is to get the underlying medical conditions sorted or fixed as much as possible um, so that you are as healthy as possible going into an IV, a fertility treatment cycle or even trying naturally. There aren't any extra drugs that we would be suggesting. So we would not be suggesting that people take steroids um, or you know, by injection or tablets or anything else purely because they have an underlying autoimmune disease history. So the summary, the, summary, the main thing is work with your um, the doctor's looking after you from the autoimmune perspective to get as healthy as possible. And once you're healthy, that will maximize the chances of pregnancy, whether it's natural or with fertility treatment. Thank you. So we move to question number seven right now. Uh, we have a son who is nine years old. I got pregnant without any problem. Since then, I cannot get pregnant again. The right fallopian tube is blocked. I have been treated for Hashimoto disease and insulin resistance. I also take drugs for elevated prolactin. Ovulation is on, menstruation is regular. Is there any chance of natural conception? If not, what method of art to use? IUI or IVF? Should I, should I, uh, mm, should be used? And does it make sense at all? So I think you answered it also partially at the very beginning, but a, a small recap here. Well, I think, um, so what we, in, ter in terms of the chances of natural conception, the main factor affecting the chance of natural conception, well, the two main factors, one would be the age of the woman, which we mentioned before, and that's because of the genetic quality of her eggs. The other factor is how long has she been trying for already? So we know that for couples who are just starting to try to conceive now, then around 80% or eight out of 10 couples will get pregnant in the first year of trying. 
For those that do not get pregnant in the first year of trying, around half of them will get pregnant in the second year of trying. In the third year of trying, you're probably down to about 20% or so. So what you can see is that, that what, when we have consultations with patients, one of the first things we ask, how old is the woman? Secondly, how long have you been trying to get pregnant? Those two things massively affect the chance of predicting the chance of natural conception. So the concern I have here is that you've said you've, you've been trying to get pregnant since your son was born, who's nine years old now. So we're talking obviously seven or eight years of trying, which is a very, very long time. In terms of why you're not getting pregnant, so you've had a check and one of your fallopian tubes is blocked. If one is blocked, the other may be open, but the function of that tube may not be normal. Because when we check for fallopian tube patency, it's a very basic test. It's just injecting dye through, and does it come through the tube? We can't tell whether the tube is, is working as 100% or 70% or 50%, even if it's just open. So probably the cause of the fertility is going to be tube-related, um, pelvic problems related. So my concern about a treatment such as, well, it's coming back, so um, when you say, is there any chance of natural conception, one of your tubes is open, and I think I would be a very, very crazy doctor to say there is no chance of natural conception. It can, it can happen. Of course it can happen. But the chances will be quite low. But it's still worth trying. The second part of your question, what method of treatment, IUI or IVF? My concern with IUI or insemination treatment is that really it's just putting sperm into the uterus and then hoping that the egg and the sperm meet. If that hasn't happened already, over seven, eight, nine years of trying, then why would it happen during an IUI cycle? Again, it might happen, but probably the chances are not much higher than if you're just trying naturally. So therefore, really IVF is going to be the best treatment for you. And importantly, with IVF, the um, how long a couple have been trying for beforehand does not affect the chances of IVF working. So if you have a woman who's 37 years old and she's been trying for one year or 10 years, it makes no difference for IVF. So I think very clearly in your situation, you've been trying for a very long time, you have tubal damage, um, and I think IVF will be the best treatment for you. Okay, thank you. So finally, we move to another area of topics. Uh, question number eight. After our second, first was unsuccessful, fresh blastocyst transfer, I was given progesterone vaginally 200 milligrams three times a day. 10 days after transfer, beta was 20 milli units per milliliter, then unfortunately dropped. On the same day, I also measured progesterone. It was 7.8 nanograms per milliliter. Wasn't it too low? Shouldn't I be getting progesterone, progesterone orally or by injections too? Shouldn't I also get other medications as well, like heparin, aspirin, estradiol, prednisone? What do you say? I, I think I have to tell you, the issue of uh, measurement of progesterone in the luteal phase after IVF is a quite common thing also in Poland. Uh, Dr. Google says that, it makes sense, and many patients do it. And I know, uh, <clears throat> Rafael, last time I was over in Poland, uh, we met with the, um, the doctors in, uh, in vitro life and also CMM, and we had a discussion about this. Um, I remember it very well. So this is a very hot topic at the moment in terms of measuring blood levels of progesterone. Now, one thing to say is that during a fresh IVF cycle, then we take eggs from the ovaries, obviously, the, the woman will be producing her own progesterone. So during a fresh IVF cycle, where we're making embryos, the woman is producing her own progesterone. What we do is we have to um, top up or increase the amount of progesterone that she has. And we can do that by giving the progesterone vaginally, um, or by injection, and the old-fashioned way was an intramuscular injection. It can be given subcutaneous now, so just into the skin. Um, or you can take progesterone by mouth. Actually, in the UK you can't, but I know in, in Poland that you can take. There are some drugs that are, are licensed by mouth. Um, now, when it comes to measuring progesterone levels, the problem is, is that when you give progesterone vaginally, and um, in th this patient was on 600 milligrams a day, which is, which is a good amount, then that vaginal progesterone, it goes straight to the uterus. So obviously the uterus is sitting at the top of the vagina. That vaginal progesterone is absorbed um, into, the, into the bloodstream, 
uh, into the skin and uh, in the vaginal skin, it goes straight to the endometrium. So the amount of that progesterone in the blood is actually quite low. But that doesn't matter because to my way of thinking, there is no point in measuring the blood progesterone level if we're giving vaginal um, progesterone because it's going straight to the uterus. If you're having, if you're taking progesterone by mouth, mm -hmm. it's being absorbed from the stomach uh, and the intestine and it's going all around the body in the blood and it's going to the uterus, then yes, there might be some logic then to measuring progesterone, but there's no logic to measuring progesterone after giving it vaginally, because we know there have been the, the drug company that makes these progesterone vaginal preparations to get the license for it, um, did lots of experiments looking at the level of progesterone in the endometrial cavity by doing a biopsy as part of research studies. And they showed that the amount of progesterone in the endometrial cavity, which is where you want it, was the same or higher than you get by giving um, progesterone by mouth or by injection. Because if you think about it, if you give it by mouth or by injection, much of it is lost as it goes around the body, and the amount that makes it to the uterus is actually a lot lower than if you give it directly to the uterus. So I would say um, for the patient, you know, the result was 7.8, wasn't it too low? I can understand that you were concerned about that, but um, really it's, we don't know what that test result means you were getting enough progesterone the reason for the failed implantation will not have been due to lack of progesterone it will be driven by the embryo coming back to what we said um, earlier on so you can always give more progesterone if you want and you're saying shouldn't you get it by mouth or injections and yes as we said that will increase the amount in the blood but it won't make any difference to the amount in the uterus and then the very last part of your question shouldn't you have other medications as well, such as heparin, which is a blood thinner, aspirin, estrogen, or steroids, comes back to what we said earlier. This is driven by the by the embryos in general. So taking other medications, and all of those ones you mentioned, particularly heparin, aspirin, and, and, and steroids, do have some risks associated with them. So my view would be we should only be using those medications if there's a proven abnormality that we're trying to, to treat. To Three years ago, before we had joined the TFP, I have to tell you that we used many extra treatments. Now, uh, I decided to reduce it whenever it is possible. I, I wouldn't say that in every cycle we don't add uh, heparin or, or uh, prednisone even by some doctors. But what happened that the pregnancy rates dramatically improved? And I think they dramatically improved because the quality of the lab work dramatically improved. So there are simple things which stay behind it rather than uh, theories which are related to unproven research. And, uh, exactly. exactly. Like, you know, I know, you know, from our from our, um, our key performance indicator meetings, our KPI meetings that we do as a, as a, as a the TFP, um, a few times a year we sit down, we look at all the results between the laboratories um, and between the different clinics, and we 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 um, we standardise it. So we look to say, well, a 34-year-old patient coming to you know, uh, Oxford, Future Life, London, CMM, what would her success rates be? Because we want them to be the same. It shouldn't matter whether a patient goes to that clinic or that TFP clinic. We want them to be the same. And obviously we want them to be higher, ideally. So we always look at best practice. And what we found, as you know, Rafael, over the years that we've been working together, is all of our success rates have gone up and up and up because we're learning from best practice. And we've learned from things that, that you guys have done in Poland and you've learned from us and vice versa. And you're absolutely right that the more we focus on what's going on in the lab and in just, in just making that IVF cycle or that treatment cycle um, as successful as it can be every step along the way, both from the stimulation, the type of drugs, the type of protocol, how we do the egg collections, what happens in the lab, how we do the embryo transfers, all these sorts of things, focusing on not the basic stuff, but focusing on, focusing on the fundamentals Fundamental. is how you get a good success rate. As soon as you start thinking, well, I'll, I'll throw in this or throw in this or throw in this, I think you get unfocused and you look, you, you, you're almost giving excuses as to why it's not working rather than focusing on the things that, that we maybe can make a difference. And we know that success rates in, in, you know, in, in vitro life and CMM are excellent success rates. I can see that. And that's, by, that's because you're all focusing on the fundamentals. A small explanation for our Polish patients. 
CMM is a clinic in, in Kraków that we have, and its name is in Polish is Macierzyństwo. So CMM is an abbreviation that's easier to say it in English <laughs> rather than Macierzyństwo. <laughs> okay. Um, hello. Uh, my husband is and I are 30 years old. His semen is good. He have been trying to have a baby. We've been trying to have a baby for eight months. I have regular cycles every 28 days. Unfortunately, I have endometrial cysts three on the right and 1.5 centimeters on the left ovary. What should we do now? To operate or not to operate? That's the question. It's a very good question, this one. And this is obviously a lot of the questions we've had until now have been people who've had, uh, uh, sadly, a long time of trying or a number of IVF failures. This is coming to the other end of the spectrum now. This is a couple who are almost starting out on their fertility journey. Um, so, you know, you know, the woman is young, 30 years old, is, is young from a fertility perspective. Sperm quality is good. So those are two important points. You've been trying for eight months, which um, I'm sure feels like a long time, but obviously we've just heard about nine years. So that shows you that eight months um, is, is not too long. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier on, we know that the two main factors affecting the chance of natural conception are the age of the woman and how long you've been trying for. So for you being 30 and trying for eight months are, are two positives, which tell me that there is still going to be a good chance of natural um, conception. You also have regular cycles, which means that you are highly likely to be ovulating or releasing an egg um, every month. Now, I'm presuming that these, um, the, it appears you have endometriosis, which is a common condition. About 20% of women have endometriosis, and we know that in some people it causes no symptoms at all, in some people it causes pelvic pain, in some people it causes fertility problems. Um, so endometriosis has been, has been picked up in you probably on scan, ultrasound scan, I'm imagining from the way the question has been, has been asked. Um, so the question, as Rafael said, is should surgery be done or not? So there are studies looking at whether treating endometriosis in women um, who are having problems with conceiving improves the chance of um, natural conception. And the studies suggest that it does. So having laparoscopic or keyhole surgery to remove endometriosis has been shown to improve the success rate. I will say though, that it's, it's, it does improve it, but it's not an amazingly dramatic improvement. The largest studies that have been done have suggested that women, when they have endometriosis removed, compared to just leaving it alone and trying naturally, you improve your chance of natural conception by around 30 to 50%, so by around a third to a, to a half. So you're not doubling it or tripling it, but you are, you are improving it. So if this endometriosis has been picked up on scan, so they've seen cysts in the ovaries, what we don't know is whether there's endometriosis in other places as well. Because an ultrasound scan can normally only see endometriosis cysts in the ovaries. But endometriosis you can have all over the place. It could be sticking fallopian tubes down, it could be sticking the ovaries in the wrong place away from the fallopian tubes. So I think at some point, if you're still not pregnant, then yes, surgery would be worthwhile. I probably would be saying to you that if you if you have very severe pelvic pain from the endometriosis and you want to have the pelvic pain treated and you have this fertility problem, then I would be saying, let's move on to laparoscopy quite soon. If you don't have pelvic pain, so this endometriosis has been picked up purely because of fertility investigations, then I probably would be saying to you, well, let's maybe try for a few more months, three, three or four more months, get up to a year of trying, and then if you're still not pregnant by a year, then perhaps at that point jump in with, with surgery. Because you have to remember that every, every medical treatment has a benefit, but it also has a risk as well. So many patients think when they hear about endometriosis cysts, they think that these cysts must be on the outside of the ovaries. They're not, they're on the inside. So to treat those cysts, and you've got them in both ovaries, is going to involve opening the ovaries up, which will cause some damage. It's, in, it's impossible to remove endometriosis cysts without causing a bit of damage. So you want to have a skilled surgeon do it, but you have to accept the ovary has to be opened up. So if you can get pregnant without surgery, obviously that is, that is preferable. So that is why my view would be um, that to maybe leave it for a few months, 
just to really test your fertility further. Um, and then once you're at 12, 14 months of trying, if still not pregnant, then perhaps surgery at that time with someone who does a fair amount of endometriosis surgery. They can treat the, the, the cysts. I mean, the 1.5 cyst is very, very small, so they maybe would have to even leave that one alone unless it's very easy to be seen. The three centimeter one would be easier to see and treat. They would also look to see, is there any endometriosis elsewhere that can be stripped away or burnt away as well to improve your conception? But as I said, if you, if you have pelvic pain at the moment now as well, that you want treated, then it'd be reasonable to move more quickly. Having said all of that, there is no right or wrong answer with this. So we're not talking about cancer treatment where you know someone has cancer, there's a drug there, and you're thinking, well, why you know take that drug? That is gonna save your life. That is not what we're talking about here. There is no right or wrong answer, and, and what suits one couple does not suit another couple. So as doctors, all we can say to you is we can help guide you so that you make a decision which is right for you. And then if you make that decision and that's right for you, that's great. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. There is no wrong decision here. So I've just spoken through a few different routes there. But if you decided you never wanted surgery at all, that's absolutely fine. Yeah. You can change your mind in a year's time. Uh, my dilemma is that in, in endometriosis patients, it's, it's worth to know uh, if the pelopian tubes are patent or not, because uh, there are heavy odds in favor of lack of patency in that particular case. So if you'd like to check for the patency of the fallopian tubes, you'd probably like to do laparoscopy. But if you do laparoscopy, you are already in abdominal cavity. So why not to operate the cysts? And, and, and yeah. it's that, this is the, you know, a kind of a vicious circle. And uh, yeah, well, like I told, like you told, I mean, many, many patients are undecided, do not help us to, to help them take the right decision. And also the doctors don't know what to do. And uh, I think that in the majority of cases, it really depends where they work. If they work in a hospital, they would prefer to go for, for, for surgery. If they work uh, in a, an IVF clinic, a more conservative treatment is advocated in that, in that particular cases. In these I, I agree, you're right. I mean, once you, once you go down the route of laparoscopy uh, you know, to, to investigate the fallopian tubes, <clears throat> as a surgeon, if you then see endometriosis there, it's going to be very difficult to not remove it. And I'm sure it's the right thing to remove yeah. it. So, you know, if, if this patient was thinking that they preferred, if possible, to avoid surgery, then I think having a check of the fallopian tubes with a, a high cozy scan or something like that would, would be worthwhile. Because absolutely, if the tubes are thought to be blocked on, on scan, then a laparoscopy to investigate the tubes more fully would make sense. So I think... If there's pelvic pain and you want treatment now, then go to laparoscopy now, check the tubes, remove the endometriosis. If you don't have pelvic pain and you want to avoid surgery, then at some point perhaps check the tubes with a, with a, a, a scan. Um, or just leave everything alone, keep trying, and then when you get to 12 months, maybe do everything in one go then. As I said, there's no rush wrong answer, and whatever suits you is right for you. Thank you. So for your information, in, in Poland, we have guidelines which say that you can consider operation in patients who have cysts larger than three or four centimeters. Why three, why four? Uh, well, we, we just read a lot and, and we follow also the guidelines of, of ESHRE, which actually write the same. But whatever they do, I mean, the patients and the doctors, be careful during operations, because I think this is the most common reason for diminished ovarian reserve in young patients. Yeah, I, I, I think there's been, I mean, if I think back to, um, you know, 15, 10, 15, 20 years ago, we were much more aggressive with, with endometriosis surgery. If we saw, if we found an endometriosis cyst on laparoscopy, on, on, the, on scan, we immediately would be talking to the patient about going in and having surgery. And I think there's been quite a big move away from that because, Rafael, as you said, um, it is a common cause of, of reduced ovarian reserve. And once those eggs are gone, they're not coming back. So I, I, I'm much more cautious than I would have been 10 or 15 years ago in terms of saying to people, well, that's why I said, well, maybe just wait a bit longer. If you have pelvic pain, it's a bit different. There's another reason maybe yeah. to treat. Yeah. If the yeah. only thing is, is fertility. Well, we have patients now with four, five, six centimeter endometriomas who are, who are heading into IVF. And we often will just leave them alone. We won't, we won't have surgery because if you do surgery for a six centimeter endometrioma, you absolutely will damage the ovaries. It's impossible to strip that cyst away and to have no damage for the ovaries at all. You, you have to do something. And finally, question number 10. 
we have 10 frozen good quality blastocysts. When is it best to transfer them? In a natural cycle or in a cycle supported with estrogen and progesterone? <laughs> You saved, a, you saved a nice question there till the end, Rafael. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so we have, um, so here in, in Oxford, we have uh, a quite a large research program looking at different uh, methods or different regimes of frozen embryo transfer. This has always been a very understudied area because the focus has been on the high tech lab stuff. You know, what can you do in the lab? What can you do with the different drugs during a fresh IVF cycle? And what has happened over the last 10 years is the amount of freezing, obviously in, in, in Poland you have your laws around freezing as well, but around the world, the amount of embryo freezing has, has gone up hugely because of vitrification, because of improved laboratory techniques. So during a fresh IVF cycle, we're now making more and more good quality blastocysts and we can freeze them better and better as well. So how to put those frozen embryos back has always been, as we say in England, like the poor cousin. It's just been sort of a bit ignored, really. So that is something that we've been very interested in for a few years. So the research that we have done um, has shown that if the woman has regular menstrual cycles, so if the person asking this question has regular cycles and is ovulating, so if you can do urine um, LH surge tests and pick up ovulation, which means you're ovulating, then the success rate with doing a natural, so no drugs at all, a natural or a medicated, so using progesterone and estrogen, as you say, um, frozen cycle is exactly the same. So we did a randomized trial here where a computer decided whether women with regular cycles, a computer decided whether they had a natural or a medicated frozen cycle, and the implantation rate and live birth rate was the same. And that's been shown in other, other studies since um, as well. One thing to say is that our approach here is when we do a natural cycle, we keep it very natural. So we don't give any progesterone supplementation at all. So the way that we do it is we, um, we, we, we bring the woman in for a scan, looking to see, are there, is she developing a follicle in her ovary? So again, no stimulation, nothing at all. Is she developing a follicle in her ovary? Once we see that there's a dominant follicle there, of 14 or 15 millimeters or more, we then ask her to start checking for ovulation with um, two times per day, so morning and evening, urine predictor kit. We just use one of the standard ones from the pharmacy. Once she's ovulated, we then bring her back in for a scan to look to confirm ovulation. We look for the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum is where the egg has come out of, of the follicle. Once we see that, so we've known that she's ovulated because she's had a urine surge, and we've confirmed it on scan with the corpus luteum. What we then do is six days, so six days after she had her urine positive surge, six days after that, we then would thaw out and transfer the one or two um, blastocysts back. And that's how we do a natural cycle. And the success rates are very, very, very good. As I said, just as good, if not maybe even better than a medicated. And just the final thing to say is, interestingly, there's a lot of research coming out now looking at what happens to the pregnancies in these frozen cycles, whether you do natural or medicated. And interestingly, the, the recent studies are suggesting that the pregnancies may be less complicated if they come from a natural frozen compared to a medicated frozen. And it's thought that that might be because um, I mentioned the corpus luteum. So after ovulation, um, the corpus luteum that the woman has produces your own progesterone and estrogen. And that keeps on going until around seven or eight weeks of pregnancy when the placenta takes over. So it's felt that in a natural cycle, that the, the fact that there's a corpus luteum, that the woman is producing her own natural levels of progesterone and estrogen must have some long-term benefit in that pregnancy because it appears that the risks of complications such as high blood pressure in pregnancy, which is called preeclampsia. So the risks of preeclampsia in pregnancy appear to be lower in women who've had that frozen embryo put back in a natural compared to a medicated cycle. Now, I don't want to suggest that it's wrong to have a medicated cycle. So our approach is that we say to women who have regular menstrual cycles, you have a choice um, of a natural or medicated. 
some women think, well, do you know what? I maybe I don't trust my body. I want to take some medication you're giving me. That's absolutely fine. The success rates, as I said, are essentially the same. Many women will say, no, I want to do it completely natural. If the woman has irregular cycles, so if the woman is not ovulating regularly, then she cannot have a natural cycle. You have to have a medicated cycle. And that's not a problem because a medicated cycle can work very, very well. Thank you. Tim, it's been a wonderful meeting so far. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, may, may I have to ask you two questions, like um, the questions which uh, are areas of my particular concern and which are addressed sometimes by the patients? Not that often, but things like that happen. Tell me, do you believe in empty follicles syndrome? Like, you know, uh, we stimulate the patient, we have three, five follicles, no eggs retrieved. Um, I mean, I think, so the word, adding the word syndrome to it, so syndrome means it's a medical condition. Yeah. So as soon as you add syndrome to something, you're, we're medicalizing it and we're meaning that there's, what we're saying is there's an underlying cause of it, even though we might not know what that underlying cause is. It's, um, if we think about it, if we have a woman with 20 follicles, it is very, very, very rare to get zero eggs. And usually if that happens, it's because there's been a, a problem that you can trace back. And the problem will be something like um, either she forgot to take or there was a problem with a late night trigger. So the last drug you take before an IVF collection, and that could be Ovitrel or, you know, it's essentially it's HCG, it's the hormone. And that HCG single injection switches the uh, maturation on of the eggs. It makes the eggs mature. It makes the follicles mature it then lets the eggs come out. If you don't take that injection, either could you forget or it was not given correctly or there was a problem with the drug, then that would be a reason why we would get no eggs um, out. So getting, getting, getting no eggs out, if someone has 10, 15, 20 follicles, would be very rare if, if the cycle has been done properly. Um, the question you asked, Rafael, you said if you get no eggs from, you know, three or four or five follicles. Well, I think the problem then is that that's a low number of follicles. So chance comes into play as well. So we know that when we do an, uh, when we do an IVF collection and we put the needle into the follicle and we aspirate, um, so we use a negative pressure, we aspirate the fluid from the follicle and then the lab look for an egg within the fluid. On average, we probably get eggs from maybe 60 or 70, maybe 75 percent of the follicles. So it's not 100 percent on average. So therefore, if a woman has a low number of follicles, sometimes, unfortunately, through chance, we're going to get no eggs out of four or five follicles. If we do a thousand egg collections for women with five follicles, it has to be that some people get five eggs, some people get zero eggs purely through chance. So with low follicle numbers, then I think chance is often what's going on. Now, having said that, even in patients with high follicle numbers, we do have patients who have 20 follicles. They have three egg collections in a row. And each time you're only getting five or six eggs. So for some patients, they, they definitely have a predisposition. They have an underlying issue, which, is, which means that they are more likely to have low numbers of eggs collected. And therefore, if they only have five follicles, then yes, it may be um, no eggs collected. Now, what can we do about that? So what I would do if we saw that someone had um, a low proportion of eggs being collected, we obviously would look at the at what happened during that cycle. Was she absolutely sure that everything was done correctly? I would also be checking whether any other patients at the same time who had a problem, because if there was, that could mean that the batch of drugs that there was a problem with that. I have to say that's very, very unusual nowadays with the good quality medications that come through. But I'd be looking then in her next cycle, I'd be looking to see, well, is there anything that we can change in terms of the protocol? So if she was on a recombinant type of, of drug, such as Gonalef or something like that, I'd probably be looking to change or, or blend it with a urinary drug. So just changing the, the type of hormones that's stimulating the ovaries. For the trigger, I would also be looking at the trigger. So either changing from a recombinant, which means laboratory made or a pure one, changing to a urinary type of one, 
or maybe giving a higher dose, so doubling up or giving two times, just sort of throwing everything at the situation. Um, then from the egg collection procedure, are we happy that the egg collection procedure was done in the optimal way? Which again, I mean, any, any doctors working in within the TFP clinics are very skilled at their egg collection. We monitor everyone's egg collection technique. We monitor the numbers of eggs they get out. So we know that everyone is good at doing them, but just making sure that there are no issues there from the equipment point of view, from the doctor perspective um, as well. So, but so summarizing that, um, do I believe in empty follicle syndrome? Well, yes, I do believe that some patients have a, um, uh, an underlying issue, which means that they, they have um, their pickup rate, their rate of picking up eggs will be very, very low. And if they have low numbers of follicles, that might mean zero eggs collected. So we should try and increase the number of follicles in those patients, maybe push them a bit harder with the stimulation. So that if they are, if we are only getting eggs from 10% of follicles, because of their underlying situation. If we get 20 follicles, that's two eggs. If we get five follicles, that could be that could be zero eggs. Again, I'm sorry, another long answer to a short yeah, question. It's, it's, it's great. Tim, and the final question. Uh, there's a growing um, number of questions regarding uh, failed fertilizations. And um, as you probably are aware that in Poland, we do mostly ICSIs, which is related to uh, actually money issues. We want to be sure that uh, uh, the patient is not losing IVF cycle, and with ICSI, you might expect uh, high fertilization rates. However, some questions uh, refer to failed fertilizations after ICSI. What would you what would you tell the patients? So again, partly it comes down to numbers. So the, the, the fertilization rate with ICSI is probably normally around sixty five or seventy percent. So it's not a hundred percent. So if a couple have three or four eggs being well, say three eggs. So three eggs being um, fertilized, um, sorry, three eggs being injected with sperm, on average, you would expect two of the eggs to be successfully fertilized. But again, if we have 100 patients with three eggs, some people are going to have zero or one, purely through chance, just nothing else. So there's always chance at play with this. If there are higher numbers of eggs there that are being injected, which I know is a different situation in Poland, but we, if we have a situation where we have 10 or 15 eggs being inseminated with ICSI, and we see that there's zero or very, very low fertilization rate, then that is not chance. That means there's something, there's something going on with that. The question is what investigations should be done? So we have a research project that we've been running for a while here, looking at something called um, PLC Zeta. So PLC Zeta is something on sperm which um, is, is to do with fertilization. So when the sperm gets inside the egg, the PLC Zeta helps activate the egg and it makes and it shows fertilization. So we've shown that there are some men that have, um, in, in couples where they have failed fertilization of good numbers of eggs, where the cause of it is absence of this protein on, on the sperm. Now at the moment, it's, it's being done as a research study. It's not a commercially available test. If we see, that there is a problem, um, you can't fix the man, but what you can do is you can do something called um, artificial oocyte activation, where the um, at the time of ICSI, the egg is also given um, a high dose of a, a type of calcium, which can which it appears can help improve the um, the, the successful insemination or fertilization rate. Is that available in, in Poland, Rafael? We've never tried it yet, so I have no experience, but I think we can do it, right? So. Yeah, so, so artificial oocyte activation. So we're allowed to do it in the UK. Um, in Oxford, we're lucky because we have this research project. So for men with, as I said, for couples with, with uh, failed fertilization or very, very low fertilization rates, we can actually test the man to see, has he got a problem? And if he has, we can do AOA or artificial oocyte activation. But the HFEA, which is a government agency that licenses us, does allow clinics to use AOA but we have to have a very clear reason why, which would be, for instance, very low fertilization rates. So that's one thing. Well, another aspect would be, I think, that if a couple are having many eggs that are not being, again, I wouldn't bother if it's just three or four or five, I probably would say, well, this might be chance, but let's go on and, and, and try with some more some more eggs. But if, if, if convincingly there is a problem with failed fertilization or low fertilization rates, then other aspects that can be looked at are maybe the genetics of the man and the woman. So 
again, coming back to the carrier type test that I mentioned before. So is there a translocation or is there an underlying problem that may be affecting the genetic quality of the eggs or the sperm? The second thing, again, a bit of a controversial one, is sperm DNA fragmentation. Um, so that is looking at the, the, the sort of genetic quality of the sperm with a test. When I say it's controversial, it's not entirely accepted that it's definitely worth doing a sperm DNA fragmentation test. But if you pick up that the man has got raised sperm DNA fragmentation, then you can try and improve that by improving his diet. So again, less processed food, and more of a Mediterranean type diet. There are certain types of multivitamins, so antioxidant multivitamins that, that may help as well. Um, in the UK, we would switch from doing conventional IVF into doing ICSI, because ICSI is good for men with high sperm DNA fragmentation. We also use a technique called PIXI. PIXI is physiological ICSI, and it's a technique where the sperm, before we do an insemination, the sperm is put into a special chamber, and, and the, the idea is that the healthy sperm bind to a membrane, and the lab then just choose those sperm for ICSI. So it's like, sort of like combined IVF and ICSI. And studies have been a bit conflicting on whether PIXI is beneficial for men with raised sperm DNA fragmentation or for couples with failed fertilization, but it is something that we often would, would try um, as well. Beyond that, there may not be a lot else that can, that, that can be tried to answer with you, but very often I think it is chance explains it and usually bad luck runs out. So it's a case of just keeping going. Good, Jim. Thank you very much. You're it's welcome, it's been really a great meeting, uh, really a feast for me. I think the patients would, would admire that also. And what can I tell you? We will not let you go. Uh, today, obviously, yes, but uh, I think sooner or later, we would like to invite you again to answer next questions, which probably, or I'm sure, uh, will be asked by our Polish patients. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the invite to uh, take part in this. And it's, um, you know, it's great that you've built up a community like you have done with your, with your Polish patients and um, any collaborations that we can, that I can be involved with, I'll be more than happy to. So thank you for the invite. Thank you, gentlemen. Szanowni Państwo, Szanowni Państwo, nasza rozmowa dobiegła końca. Wymiana doświadczeń, dzielenie się najlepszymi praktykami, opieka, troska, doświadczenie, profesjonalizm, pasja, zaufanie, innowacja to wartości, które właśnie realizuje The Vertility Partnership i której byliście Państwo właśnie świadkami. Wspaniała, wartościowa i kaloryczna rozmowa dwóch wspaniałych, światowej klasy ekspertów. Szanowny Panie Rafale, dziękujemy, że mogliśmy być świadkami tego wspaniałego wydarzenia, że nam to umożliwił, jako właśnie jedna z klinik, która należy do tej wspaniałej organizacji, The Fertility Partnership. Szanowni Państwo, jeżeli dzisiaj nie padło Wasze pytanie, to uspokajam, na pewno ono padnie w kolejny czwartek o 17.30 w naszej kawiaretce w płodności Vitrolife. A tymczasem dziękujemy za udział, za wysłuchanie naszej rozmowy, za Wasze pytania i do zobaczenia już w najbliższy czwartek. Pozostańcie Państwo w zdrowiu. Do usłyszenia. Dziękuję. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.